Hi everyone, uh, uh, welcome to another uh, series of uh, uh, pure webinars and uh, we've got uh, a very exciting topic today with two very exciting speakers that uh, uh, I think both of us come, uh, uh, all of us come quite a, a long way together. So uh, today's session is finding a voice, how the travel industry can unify for good. And, and we've got two uh, uh, great speakers today. We've got, uh, first of all, George Morgan Granville, uh, someone that I've known for quite a while. I think we, we met the first time in San Diego in 2007 at the American Express uh, Luxury Conference. And believe it or not, he was one of the target on the list that absolutely wanted to talk to. And, uh, and uh, it, it, it not to see me, I, I, I met on that day, uh, someone that has been uh, a real guiding force for me and a mentor and someone that I truly respect and, uh, and I come to see on a regular basis throughout the years uh, to make sure that uh, I can get some uh, insight knowledge of what's happening uh, in the travel industry and, uh, and it's George Morgan Granville uh, which is the CEO and founders of Red Savannah and, uh, and I have to say that uh, George is uh, someone who's got an incredible vision, uh, uh, an incredible drive, um, uh, which is a strategist uh, but also someone who's got an incredible amount of energy, uh, not only in building his companies, but uh, defending his industry whenever it's, uh, it is possible and whenever it is necessary, uh, as he did it into uh, the case of uh, the, the quarantine, the question the quarantine, which I'm going to explain. So I'm very glad that he's here and I'm going to explain his initiative as well. And obviously, Paul Charles uh, from the PC agency, Paul is very well known. Uh, as being one of the great commentators on travel and tourism. Uh, he used to be the ex-communication directors for uh, Richard Branson at Virgin Atlantic. Uh, his PR agency is one of the most influential in London, and, uh, and he's always on the, on the power list of the people who are uh, uh, the most influential and powerful group when it comes to PR. Uh, and therefore, it's not surprising that George and Paul uh, uh, join force together, uh, and especially John force for an initiative which is Quash the Quarantine. So to, to give a bit of story of background, I think that we've all been surprised by obviously how COVID-19 uh, hurted us, but also by sometimes the response of our respective governments. And I think that there might be a feeling in an industry which is usually extremely fragmented that we were there on our own. And I think that uh, George and Paul have created initiatives where They've been incredibly inclusive and they have decided not only to uh, resist but to try to act together not for the benefit only of the company but for the benefit of the industry so the challenge of government uh, they went to an initiative which is squash the quarantine which we were very happy to support uh, from the onset uh, and i think it's a great testimony of uh, our industry of individual trying to take the flag and try to join forces with other people to try to achieve something. And, uh, and I can't comment enough uh, the initiative, how far they went and how much energy uh, they spent to uh, see that initiative. And, uh, and therefore, I'm, I'm quite excited also to know all the uh, intricacy of the whole operations, all the challenge they had to face. And uh, so without further ado, I would like everyone to welcome Paul and George on that discussions. Uh, which I think is going to be very interesting, and uh, that's why I wanted to personally introduce it myself. So uh, we're there for about an hour for a very exciting time. And Paul and George, over to you. Thank you very much, Serge. That's very kind of you to uh, introduce us, and we're honoured to to be here today to explain to the this is beyond audience a bit more about the Quash Quarantine campaign, uh, and also, of course. Uh, very much around trends in the industry and where we're heading in the next uh, next few months. So uh, George is also on video joining, like myself, from the Gloucestershire area. So hopefully, George, you can hear us okay. Yeah, I can hear you, Paul. Thanks very much, and 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 Serge, thank you very much for that very um, very kind introduction. And and actually, I would say it's the other way around. I think I've always looked at you as a bit of a mentor. So. If we've been mentoring each other, it's probably a disaster for the industry. 
But we'll, uh, we'll find out more about that mentoring later. In the meantime, if anyone, as we're going through, has any questions they'd like to uh, put to George, uh, to Serge or to myself during the next uh, 55 minutes or so, then please do ask them via the, uh, the Q&A session on Zoom. Um, George, I'm going to kick off by, uh, we're obviously going to talk about cross quarantine and some of the uh, background to it and, and what we've been doing. But uh, it was your idea in the first place. What was it that frustrated you so much about the government plans at that time to introduce some form of quarantine measure in the UK? Well, Paul, I, I don't think I'm alone in, in waking up one day and suddenly thinking, what on earth is this whole quarantine campaign about? So the government started mooting it in, uh, in early May that they were going to implement it uh, in June. And I don't think anyone really thought they would go ahead and do it. I think many people believe they should have done it right in the early stages um, of coronavirus when there were flights coming in from Iran and Wuhan and many other areas and no one could really understand why the government hadn't done it the government kept saying that they all their advice was it wouldn't make any difference then uh, we went through the lockdown process uh, everybody's sales uh, went through the floor and suddenly the government announced that they're going to put quarantine in place in the middle of in early june and it doesn't make any sense and so i think there's a lot of us all scratching our heads thinking why i mean this this sounds like a this sounds like a political decision uh, and not a public health decision and i think i woke up um in fact i remember it was the bank holiday weekend at the end of may and the government was still saying that they were going to implement quarantine on the 8th of june and i woke up on that saturday morning and i thought you know what enough is enough you know, nobody seems to be making any uh, any noise about this and, you know as an industry are we going to just take this lying down and see you know any chance of a summer recovery being um, completely annihilated by the implementation of, of quarantine. And I thought, we just can't, we can't do that. So I wrote a letter to the Home Secretary, Priti Patel. And then I thought, well, she's, she's not going to have a clue who I am. Um, and so maybe this would be better if I got a few people uh, on side. So I emailed uh, several travel companies. And I was amazed at how quickly they came back and how passionate they were in their responses. And I began to realize that people really minded about this, um, and but what it needed was a, a unifying voice. And so by the end of the weekend, I've got uh, about 70 travel companies and major London hotels uh, together. And the letter went off to Pretty Patel um, on the following Monday. And in terms of what it said, um, without going through the whole thing, what, what were those key messages that you felt had to be got across to the Home Secretary and in fact, presumably to Boris Johnson and the rest of government as well? Uh, well, I think firstly that um, I thought perhaps they were underestimating or they hadn't really investigated the size of the industry. I mean, this is a, you know, the UK travel industry is a, is a 213 billion pound industry. It employs about 11% of the UK's workforce, um, which equates to about 4 million people. And it represents about 9% of GDP. And my view, and that what I was trying to communicate to Priti Patel was, you know, if you're gonna mess with the, um, a sector of the economy that's this size, you better have a very good reason for doing it. So if you go ahead with quarantine, we want to understand what that reason is, on what scientific basis are you going to impose quarantine? And the second um, part of it was, there needs to be more correlation between what the Foreign Office is saying and what the Home Office is saying. So we had this, this, um, this sort of double whammy of, of quarantine stopping any inbound business. So the, the UK hotels and the UK DMCs, the inbound business was being hammered and the Foreign, Office, Foreign and Commonwealth Office travel advice against all but essential travel. 
was stopping any outbound travel. And, but the Home Office and the Foreign Office didn't appear to be talking to each other. Um, and so, really, it was a, we want to know on what scientific basis this is going ahead. And do you realise what sort of damage you're about to do? And secondly, why are you implementing some legislation or secondary legislation on which has been no impact assessment carried out and no consultation? I suppose uh, when you look at other countries around the world, and obviously we've got a lot of people watching from not just the UK, but all over the world today. When you look at other countries, there were some that introduced quarantine very early on in their pandemic journeys. Is, is that the ideal, that if you are going to introduce a quarantine, you, you should have done it in February or March at the start of the pandemic journey and not in June? And that that's partly why the UK has suffered. Well, Paul, I'm not an expert on, 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 on science, um, but um, you know, there are a number of scientific groups out there that have been leading the government. Um, and many of them are subgroups of, of what became known as SAGE. And in particular, the, um, I think it's called, it's called SPIM. Uh, they all have wonderful acronyms, but um, SPIM, I think is the scientific, um, pandemic uh, influenza uh, modeling uh, group. But you know, there are, there are some of the top scientific minds in the country belong to that organization. And as far as I could see, not one of them supported the government uh, in terms of implementing quarantine when it did. Nearly all of them said it would have been sensible to implement it at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, but none of them could understand the basis on which it was being implemented in the middle of the pandemic, in fact, after the R rate had gone below one. So you sent this letter um, to Pretty Patel. Uh, have you actually had any response to that letter yet? <laughs> That's the million dollar question. The short answer to that is no. And uh, I'm sure I'm sure the Home Secretary gets a lot of letters, so she's probably uh, Still wading through those but do you think it's perhaps more that the government um, was starting to to realize at the time that your letter went in and the number of signatories started to grow and the endorsers started to grow that there was more opposition to this than they had realized at the outset yeah I, I think very much so I mean look as this campaign began to get going and I have to say it got going very fast much more quickly than I'd anticipated um, and for some reason and you know largely to do with your help actually Paul um, it, it, it caught the eye of the media and I think the media were very much uh, in sync uh, with our thinking and um, really the, the government I think were looking for an exit from it um, but they, they equally did not want to admit that they'd got it wrong or that they'd done it for anything other than public health reasons. So they implemented this, um, this arbitrary review date of the 29th of June. But in the background, we were hearing from many MPs uh, privately and through private channels who were saying, this is ridiculous. I mean, I, I, you know, I'll quote one MP who said, I'm embarrassed by my own government. This is a very senior MP, very close to number 10. And um, I think all of them were, well, not all of them, but I think a vast majority of constituency MPs were horrified by what was going on. And I think probably uh, a lot of us in travel were also horrified. I mean, how did your numbers grow? Because you, you started off with 70 or 77 uh, endorsers for that first letter and then the media started picking up the campaign and referring to quash quarantine and then you you started to see the numbers grow across the travel community didn't you and in fact not just the travel community yes yeah, so I think it was very important that in in doing this we were we were inclusive I wanted to include everybody who didn't have a voice who wanted a voice and in fact by the end, we had, we had cafes in, on, on the coast in England. We had um, companies that supply linen to the hotel industry. I mean, no one, until you really start to take a more granular look at the 
travel business, you have no idea of how many indirect jobs are supported by the, by the industry. But predominantly, we had tour operators um, followed by hotels. And I think what we wanted to show was this it was not just the luxury end of the business that was complaining. This was the whole industry. And this was, you know, United, it, this was foes, previously people who were, who were foes being united together to, in a common aim. And the momentum sort of fed on itself, and it was helped by um, some of the travel media um, who um, were, were very vocal in their support. So we then put together um, uh, an email, a simple email address called getgoing at redsavannah.com, and the getgoing list became the sign-up tool for anybody who wanted to put their voice into the campaign. Um, and uh, we had... Um, well over 500 uh, responses on that. But I felt strongly that we had to keep this as being a UK campaign. And I was really, really delighted by some of the support we had outside of the UK. There were many DMCs around the world who were suffering because of lack of UK visitors who wanted to sign up. But in the end, we had to exclude anybody who wasn't a UK business because we felt that the government would look for excuses not to listen, um, but they couldn't. Um, they, had, I mean, they had to listen if they were all UK companies that were complaining. There's a certain irony in that, isn't there? Because, of course, um, talk to a London hotelier at the top end and they'll tell you that 50% of their occupancy is, for example, from Americans. So, you know, the government, in a way, needs that traffic. It needs that support. Uh, economically, doesn't it, from US visitors as well as other visitors from Asia and Africa, et cetera? Yeah, let me give you an example. I spoke to um, some of the hotels around Heathrow Airport. Um, most of them had had an occupancy of about 95% in May, early June last year. This year, they had dropped by the by beginning of June, pre-quarantine, they had dropped to about 6%. Post quarantine, they dropped to below 4%, um, and um, most of them shut at that point and laid off all their staff, and many of them haven't reopened. Um, so it's, it's been a disaster for the hotel industry uh, in the UK, just as it's been a disaster for the tour operators in the outbound industry. So the campaign grew, and obviously, you were then getting to the 500 level in terms of the number of supporters. Um, I think then you decided to survey that group and, and actually ask them factually and get some real facts, which the government seemed to be lacking at that point, um, around the impact that quarantine would have on them. And this was, I think, just before June the 8th, when quarantine was due to start. What, what did that survey tell you from the horse's mouth, from the CEOs, from the MDs, from the managers and owners of those? travel and hospitality companies? Well, it, it, was, it was horrifying, Paul. So we, we heard from almost everybody participated in, in that survey. And uh, once we'd analyzed it, almost two thirds of the companies that we surveyed said that they would have to make redundant anywhere between 25 and 75% of their entire staff. 85% um, of the companies surveyed said that, that if quarantine was implemented, they would lose their entire summer book of business. And most worryingly, a third of those surveyed said that if quarantine was implemented, they did not think they would make it through to the end of the year. And in fact, already we are starting to see some major failures in the travel industry announced on an almost daily basis. So the impact uh, was clear before June the 8th, and you, you then decided to make sure that information got out there. So um, that then was fed to media. And indeed, you, you put the core of that information into a second letter to the Home Secretary, Priti Patel. Have you had a reply to that one? Well, uh, <laughs> no, I haven't had a reply to that one either, actually. But um, I guess before that happened, Paul, so I think... Um, I felt that we needed to keep the pressure up. Um, and I also felt that there was a very good chance that this legislation 
was unlawful. Um, and I think, you know, for the, for the benefit of those, those listening, unlawful uh, in, when it's applied to legislation doesn't mean that it's illegal. It means that the legislation has been made outside of the law. Um, and therefore, I felt that we should take it to a judicial review and try and get an injunction uh, put on quarantine. So for the week of, weekend of the 5th and 6th of June, I spent uh, the entire weekend um, uh, locked away with um, a very good firm um, of solicitors and also one of the leading barristers in the country. And we really put together a whole strategy of how we could take the government uh, to court and, um, and, and lodge a judicial review. And that was done at the same time, I think, as, as several airlines were doing the same thing. Well, they were, but we didn't know that uh, at the time. Uh, nobody, again, as I was talking, you know, this all came about because of the lack of noise being, being made. And so I felt, you know, we had, we had the travel industry behind us. We had thousands of companies who, who wanted to be, or thousands of people who wanted to sign up, companies who had signed up. We had to make the government listen. And so, you know, they weren't answering the letters. They weren't responding to the media. Um, and so we had to make them respond. And in order to do that, we had to look at doing a judicial review. Now, that is a very expensive thing to do. Um, and so it was very clear we had to raise about £300,000 um, to get that going. Now, let's remember where we're coming from on here. So this, this was born of a letter two weeks before. Um, we had no campaign platform. We had no campaign infrastructure. We had no campaign funding. This was being done by myself and, and, and you, Paul, really. Um, and so when you start taking on a judicial review, um, you are taking on a heap of liability because if you go in as a, as a co-claimant um, and you fail, then you are personally going to be, or your company is going to be liable uh, for the government's expenses. So we set about, we decided we'd have to try and crowd, crowdfund this. And so we set about crowdfunding. So on the, on the Saturday night, I wrote to all of the 500 uh, companies and asked them to contribute. Uh, and on Monday, the money started coming in. Um, but at the same time, um, IAG announced that they were also going to pursue um, a judicial review. Now, there's a vast difference between being 500 companies who are not um, uh, united by any sort of uh, common platform um, and who, where, who've got to all subscribe their own money and an airline that probably has deeper pockets um, and where there's only three of them acting in, in unison. And so in consultation with the, with the lawyers, we decided that it was better to let the airlines fight this campaign uh, on their own. The result was going to be the same, whether it was us or the airlines doing it. And uh, no one should underestimate the difficulty of getting 500 firms to fight a legal battle uh, against the government. So the fact the airlines had stepped in was a really positive uh, move. We'll, we'll uh, talk about the learnings soon um, of that and also the campaign for the future to help the sector. But we, was it frustrating that here you had a group of 500 like-minded companies and senior individuals who all felt they wanted to quash quarantine, but um, were perhaps hamstrung by their structures or their ownership or whatever in being able to raise the money to £300,000 fairly quickly? Because that's, a, that's a, not a mean task, is it? Um. No, it's definitely not a mean task. And I think, I'll tell you what really interested me, Paul, uh, in that was that the, some of the bigger companies were being very slow to put their hand in their pocket. And some of the smaller companies were incredibly generous. And actually, you know, the many of the companies that I see at Pure year after year, you know, really good, small boutique travel companies that know their stuff, know their business, a lot of them were by far the most generous in terms of putting their hand in their pocket. 
uh, and they were the ones that really minded. You know, some of the big companies did contribute as well, but I could see that it was going to be a massive exercise to to to, to raise the three hundred thousand. I think we could have done it, and I think we could have got there, but um, it was going to take every minute of every hour of every day to get that done. And you know, in the background, I was still trying to run my own business as well. So you know, fighting a campaign is a really physically and emotionally exhausting occupation when you're trying to run a business in the background and then you've got to suddenly raise 300,000 as well um, it's a it's a very difficult proposition not insurmountable but difficult so then you decided um, that actually it would be uh, appropriate at that point to let the airlines continue their legal action which was later dropped of course um, and actually not go ahead simply because it was obviously difficult to, to raise that money and presumably the money would be better within the travel companies themselves at this really difficult time anyway, because um, everyone's been under pressure. Yeah, I think to some degree, but I mean, look, we weren't, you know, it, like all things, if, if everybody comes together, we were looking, you know, we, we put a sliding scale in place. And so that we were asking for 500 pounds from the smallest companies and three and a half thousand pounds from the biggest companies that were turning, you know, we had passenger volumes in excess of 125,000 people. Uh, and so, you know, these were, these were not really very big sums of, of money. Um, and I think really, you know, an industry that minds about its future must be prepared every now and then to put its hand in its pocket and fork out when it's for something that will ultimately um, protect the industry in the, in the future. So then if we just move on um, in the, the story, in the timeline, the quarantine measures came in on June the 8th. Uh, the government was obviously determined to go ahead with that once they'd announced it. Uh, as you said, they didn't want to, to be embarrassed. They, didn't want to, they had to save face to some extent over that period. Um, then I guess we got word from a senior government source uh, who contacted us to to say that the rules would be changed on the 29th of June, uh, which gave us, I guess, some end point, it seemed, for uh, quarantine, that already we, we were hearing that there would be changes. Um, what happened between you dropping the legal action um, and the end of June, essentially? Because you, you kept the momentum going. Uh, what was it that propelled that momentum? Well, I think we did two, th two, two things. W one was to commission the survey through audience.net. Uh, um, and that survey was quite, was quite enlightening, actually, uh, in terms of the fact that it, it said that something like 89% of the population believed that quarantine was going to cause real economic damage. Uh, and that, that fact really needed to be highlighted. Um, but then the second thing was, was, as you alluded to earlier on, was this second letter to Pretty Patel. So, you know, we talked about it a lot, but I think we felt that, you know, we needed to ramp the pressure up. And so the message to Pretty Patel was, if the judicial review is found to be uh, unlawful, if the government is found to have acted unlawfully, then our feeling was that she should resign. That, you know, she, this may not, she may not have been the architect of this policy, but she was the person tasked with implementing it, and she appeared to implement it with great, with great gusto. Um, she said in Parliament that she was going to lay out the evidence for everyone to see. As far as I'm aware, she's never done that. And so we felt that um, the only honourable thing for her to do, if it was found to be unlawful, would be to resign. And I think that was not an unreasonable request. I think any minister that was found to have implemented and sponsored secondary legislation uh, that was found to be unlawful should resign. So I was surprised by um, uh, how panicky people got uh, by the second letter. There was definitely, you know, I, I think the problem with this industry is that we're a very conservative industry. The travel industry is not used to rabble rising uh, and it's not used to making a noise and I think it's why over the years the travel industry despite being such an important part of so many economies around the world 
has allowed itself to get to get beaten up by governments and I think it's I think it's it's wrong uh, that they do or we do uh, as an industry and so I, I think um, what we were trying to explain to everybody was look you know the suffragettes didn't get the vote by writing nice letters uh, to the Home Secretary the French farmers don't get amazing concessions from their government by writing nice letters to President Macron. We you know when, when something goes wrong for the French farmers, and Serge will know all about this, you know, they are out with their, with their tractors dumping slurry outside the Elysee Palace, or they're blocking the auto route or the ports, and very quickly they get what they want. Unfortunately, in the travel industry, we tend to take everything lying down and I was slightly concerned that um, some of our support began to ebb away when we asked Priti Patel to resign or, or suggested she should resign but actually when we measured it it was only about five percent and it, in, in the main it was there were some hotels and but it was also the the trade bodies uh, and the trade bodies ran a mile uh, at that stage and specifically asked to be excluded and I thought that was very disappointing because I thought the trade bodies should have really been standing up to the government at that point and I know we've had a few back and forths on this and we can talk about it in in, in a minute at the end but um, overall 95% um, of our 500 companies stood like true rocks um, and supported the second letter. Great. Well, we'll come back to that in a minute. We've got about 25 minutes left. Keep the questions coming in because we'll, we'll come on to questions um, shortly. Um, so then, essentially, as June went on, the quarantine measures obviously were in place. Um, as I understand it, there's still been no fines levied by the government for anyone breaching the quarantine rules. And then, of course, um, at the end of June, on the 26th of June, the UK government announced they would stop the blanket quarantine measures. So do you feel then that the government did listen, that the, the campaign had an impact, um, albeit with others involved around the UK, but, but fundamentally they, they did quash quarantine and listen to what you were saying, didn't they? Yeah, I, th I think the campaign had, a, had an impact. I mean, you know, we'll, we'll never know. Would they, would they have uh, stopped quarantine anyway? I mean, I think what we do know is it was absolutely a political and not a public health measure. I think they realized they got it wrong. Um, and they, may, they might well have quashed it anyway, but I think certainly it did no harm to get everybody uh, behind the campaign. And I certainly think from what I've heard, the government were quite taken aback by the vehemence uh, behind this campaign and by the momentum that got going and I think it was the first time the travel industry had actually snapped at the government um, and said you know we're not taking this lying down. So do you think there's, um, I mean it, it actually goes down as the shortest ever government policy I believe to be then redacted, to be then pulled away um, and obviously the government has since opened up travel corridors. Do you, do you think that when you talk about the unity of the travel sector, and you've talked before about the fact that traditional foes came together. Do you think then there's scope to create something uh, more detailed in terms of a united action group of some kind? You talked about the trade groups um, that exist who clearly have been around for years and had a seat at the government table and clearly have had the year of government for some time, yet on this issue they, they didn't seem to have the year of government. So do you think there's a, an opening now for some form of group to bring together these previous foes and this united group? Um, yes, uh, is the short answer to that. Um, I mean, I would prefer it if the, if the major industry groups did what I believe they should do, which has become far more effective at lobbying. You know, the airlines, have always been effective at lobbying. And the, the airlines are not really team players. They, they look after their own interests uh, and they're pretty effective on the whole at looking after their own interests. And they have affecting, effective um, lobbying campaigns of their own. The travel industry 
just never really seems to have managed to bring everybody together. And the, and the problem is there are many divergent interests within the industry. I mean, the travel industry sounds like one sector, but actually there are multiple subsectors within the industry. And so whether you're in uh, an inbound DMC or you're an outbound tour operator or you're a hotel or you're an airport representation company or a baggage handling company, they've all got different interests. And I think no one trade body has actually stepped up to the plate and said, listen, matters that affect us all we will become the body that will represent the industry against the government or against any other force that is trying to damage the industry and i think you know i've made this point previously and i know that um one or two of the trade bodies huffed and puffed a bit um after i last made it and said well it was unfair to say that because they find it's more effective to work behind the scenes but actually what does working behind the scenes really mean? Um, it means that you're not then accountable for, for a failure if you don't achieve anything, because no one knows what you set out to achieve in the first place. And actually in this particular case, none of the trade bodies were really raising their head above the parapet. And the only reason I started this campaign was because no one was making a noise. And I think it's time that the government take such a big um, sector of our economy and it, you know the travel and tourism is so important in so many countries around the world and yet in very few countries do they have uh re they put do they put their strongest people in as tourism ministers and in the uk i don't think we even have a proper tourism minister minister or it's certainly, someone certainly not a, it's certainly not in the cabinet there's a there's nigel huddleston who's a junior minister but obviously his voice has not been heard during this uh, pandemic, really. Where, yeah, where was he? Um, and, you know, I, so I think for a two, I mean, let's say 200, just put it in perspective, 213 billion, um, the travel agency represents, that makes it larger than the entire New Zealand economy put together. But this is a very big part of, of, of Britain's GDP and it should be taken more seriously. So I think to answer your question, unless one of the trade bodies is willing to stand up and say look we are going to really we're never going to allow a situation like this to happen again and if the government wishes to implement a piece of potentially possibly we'll never know now because iag dropped the case but possibly unlawful secondary legislation then we are going to fight it through the courts and we will make sure that we've got pockets deep enough to do that and hopefully it will just make the government think twice before they go and implement something for political reasons that has no perceivable public health benefits. Now we've got some great questions coming in, which I'll come to in a second. Keep them coming in on the Q&A um, tab that you've got on the Zoom at the bottom there. So keep typing them into the Q&A. Um, I want to ask, obviously now there are corridors in place. Indeed today, Greece has opened up to UK flights. Malta's opened up so that British citizens can go there. So we are now seeing an opening up, certainly in Europe uh, from the UK, um, of, of travel, which has got to be good for the sector. But I want to ask you about quarantine's impact a bit more and all the evidence that is out there that's starting to come through, and you've hinted at it already, is showing that companies are not seeing the level of bookings they might have seen without quarantine, which, which has put people off, um, which has made people fearful about traveling. What's your view on where the next few weeks, months, rest of the year are headed? Because the statistics coming out are not looking very rosy. I, I, Paul, I, I, I think we are heading for some very rough waters indeed. And I think, you know, June, was the time when the industry could potentially have got back on its feet again. That was a time where there was still availability across uh, hotels and villas all over Europe. The industry had an opportunity to take advantage of that available inventory and sell, sell, sell during June. But instead, what actually happened was quarantine was put in place and that opportunity was lost. 
and that was lot that that opportunity has really cost the industry this summer's business and there are many travel companies out there that make most of their money during the summer months okay not everybody deals with with europe and so of course there are other companies that that are not dependent on the summer but for those who are dependent on the summer this was a massive massive blow uh to them and i think um, sadly i think a lot of them are going to find it very difficult to get back on their feet again uh and i have no doubt that quarantine will be responsible for an enormous loss of jobs in this industry. Okay, well, let's go to um, first question from Natasha, who says, um, it's great to see the commitment to the industry and its employees and travelers. Uh, however, with the UK having had the second highest number of deaths from coronavirus, only topped by Russia, uh, far more than Spain or Italy, are you not concerned that you could contribute to rising numbers in the disease if you successfully had quarantine dropped what, what motivation do you feel the home secretary did have it cannot be inconsequential for governments to introduce measures like this so i guess you know whilst whilst blanket quarantine has been dropped um what what do you say to the medical point a very important health point that clearly it's designed to prevent the virus spreading further uh, yeah, I think it's a per perfectly fair point to ask, um, and I've got various various responses to that. I mean, I think first of all, the government has to, has two primary responsibilities: one is lives, and the other is livelihoods. Um, but they are they're mutually inclusive. You cannot have lives without livelihoods, and 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 vice versa. And so, in every government decision, there has to be a sensible balance between public health measures and uh and the economy or economic needs of the nation and if you starve the nation's economy the uh effect on public health is going to be catastrophic so yes um of course we should be taking coronavirus uh seriously and of course we should be taking uh, doing everything we can to minimize its spread but what happens if there's a second wave and a third wave and a fourth wave? What happens if no vaccine is found? We cannot lock ourselves down forever. Because if we do, we have only a dystopian future to look forward to. Okay. Um, let's go to the next question. So from uh, Marianne, is ABTA now defunct, having been so reluctant or silent? with its support of the industry, and it supposedly speaks for helps administered. So, I mean, ABTA isn't defunct but at the moment, but uh, it's a question to you. Do you, do you think ABTA, ABTA, their role is defunct? Look, I don't, I don't really want to get into a, a, a quarrel with, with ABTA. I think they do a lot of, um, a, a lot of good things. Um, I, I know they got very sidetracked by the, the refund issue. And I think, you know, if ABTA was sitting here um, in this debate, they would say that um, they have, uh, in fact, the argument they've put out is that, that they're fighting multiple battles on, on multiple fronts at all times. And, and therefore, it's easy for me to come out and do a, a one person campaign on one subject against the government. Um, but that's not half of what they have to face all the time. I think my response to that would be you know if abta are the de facto trade body that represent most parts of the industry then where there are matters that are coming up that affect the whole industry i personally believe they should be more vocal and they should be more willing to take the government on and I think, you know, these cosy little groups and the cosy little chats, no one knows what's said in those chats. And um, I think most importantly, the government love compliant trade bodies who, who, who don't make a noise because they can then get leaves the government free to do what they want. And I think any government, you know, this, is, this was never meant to be a political campaign. Um, you know, if it had been a Labour government that had implemented the same thing, we'd be, the response would have been exactly the same. This was about protecting our industries, not really about politics. But I think if we have an industry body 
that industry body must have a duty to stand up and make a noise and fight hard for the industry it purports to represent. There's a question linked to that from Marcus, who says, thank you, George, for an excellent conversation. How can the UK travel industry form a voice powerful enough for the government to listen? So I guess that goes back to your, your earlier point that there is a window here. Well, um, I've registered- The powerful the, enough bit, the powerful, how can it be powerful enough for the government to listen? Um, I have registered something called the Travel Action Group. Um, I, I'm not sure really whether we'll, we'll take it uh, any further. As I said earlier on, I would much prefer ABTA to take this role on and, and become more aggressive uh, in the way that they, they deal with uh, any government. Um, but um, the industry can, if it wishes, unite. Um, it's got to find somebody uh, or a platform to unite uh, behind. I think it's not an impossible um, group to try and get together and it's certainly possible to put a, a platform uh, out there but it would require people to put their hand in their pockets and build up a fighting fund and uh, you know I don't want to sound like um, uh, I want to go to war with every government uh, all the time but I think you know just once in a while there is something that really matters. And when you have something that really matters, if you've got no money and no platform to fight it, it is very, very difficult to make the government listen. Yep. Uh, next question from Norby, who asks, uh, it's a specific point really, that he's making about the, the excellent uh, event, the British bird watching the bird fair, which happens in Rutland each year. It's, uh, the largest event of its kind and very successful it is too. Clearly, and Norby is making the point here that it's very hard for um, companies based overseas, obviously, to come in and do business in the UK at, at an event like that. Um, certainly this year, next year, whether it goes ahead or not, we don't know. Um, it's stopped many international travel businesses exhibiting and, and they've lost a great deal of bookings, obviously, because of not just quarantine, but also other COVID measures. Do you think that because the travel, by its very nature, travel sector is so interconnected, that actually whatever goes on in the UK is clearly going to have a much bigger impact on those beyond the UK, not just in the UK? Yeah, look, I think the, the UK has probably the most sophisticated travel sector uh, in the world. And I think it's, you know, in many ways, it's a bellwether of what's happening uh, elsewhere around the world. Uh, and I think it's incumbent upon the UK industry to, to set the pace. Uh, and I think we should be setting, setting, setting an example and, and helping others around the world achieve the same, the, the same things. Um, but, you know, th this goes beyond just fighting one campaign into how does the industry adapt to, to coronavirus and, you know, what does it need to do going forward? And I think there are, there are, there are other aspects. Um, that will fall out of COVID-19 and that includes a, you know a comprehensive review of the whole supply chain I mean I think it's I think it's terrible that there have been so many travel companies that have not refunded their clients and you know as an industry we should be ashamed about that um, but we know why it's the case and unfortunately there are many tour operators who want to refund their clients who have not been refunded by airlines or who have made sent deposits out to operators or dmcs outside the boundaries of europe who can't get those deposits back again and so the whole supply chain is is rotten from from the core outwards and it needs to be re-looked at so there's ever a pandemic comes like this again Tour operators are in a position to refund their clients without question. And that means resetting the relationship with overseas suppliers and overseas suppliers or DMCs resetting their relationship with local hotels. There's far too much money being circulated in advance and not being put into trust accounts. So, you know, a second body is ever created. It, you know, in addition to fighting the government, it also, I think, needs to really try and reset the whole supply chain um, so that um, the industry, the, the, the cash flows within the industry flow much more freely in times of crisis. 
and reset is is the word i guess we've got uh five minutes i just want to cover off one more question and then a bit about the future um last questions from neo uh in the us we have a fight between science the cdc uh and the government the white house should we brace ourselves and wait until after the elections in november to start making any plans information is too blurry so I think the point there is the uncertainty continues in the US, like a lot of countries. Um, how on earth is it possible to plan for after the election or even into 2021? I, I'm not sure I quite get the, get, get the question. Pla plan, plan for what? Well, uh, Enia doesn't say, maybe you could quickly type that in, but, uh, but essentially I think it's the uncertainty that's continuing between CDC advice from science and Dr. Anthony Fauci, for example, and the White House and the Trump view of reopening the economy. Then you've got some states who are going back into lockdown, and clearly it's a very uncertain picture. That makes it difficult for agents or operators to confirm any plans for their, uh, for their customers, and indeed NEO says for bringing employees back as well. So does it just mean we have to live with this uncertainty at the moment? Yeah, look, for, to a degree, I think we do have to live with the uncertainty at the moment. But I think, you know, it, it's a slightly self-perpetuating situation. If you lock people down and you keep locking people down, after people become so frightened, they don't want to travel. I mean, the, the YouGov survey that came out yesterday that said something like only 20% of the population actually want to get on an aeroplane uh, and go overseas. The only way that's going to change is by word of mouth, is people who have gone who are brave enough to go, coming back and saying, look, we had an amazing time. Um, I mean, everyone I've talked to who's got on an airplane in the last two weeks said it's an incredibly pleasurable experience going through the airport tonight because they're not crowded. Everyone's very sensible. Everyone's very mindful of each other and respectful. Boarding has become much simpler. People aren't scrambling. Uh, getting off the plane has become much simpler. People are being much more considerate. And actually travel, has sort of taken on a whole new dimension. So I think as people go away and come back and report positively, I think travel will start to, to come back again. And I think for, for NEO in, in, in the US, you know, it's a very difficult situation because of course the US is really equates to, to Europe and every, every country in Europe has got a slightly different policy and every state in the US has got a slightly different uh, policy. And um, but I think what we should all be focusing on is where our rates are symmetric. We should be encouraging travel between those countries where the R rate is asymmetric. Then obviously it makes sense to keep quarantine in place. I mean, I think we're all very respectful uh, of the power of this awful disease and the damage that it can do. Nobody wants it. Uh, nobody wants to have a second wave or a resurgence. But equally, we've just got to keep everything balanced so that we've got to try and keep the economy going. We've got to try and keep the industry going and yet take the mitigating steps at the same time. Uh, final question from me to you, George, is uh, a quick 10 second answer, if you wouldn't mind, uh, before I hand back to Serge shortly. Um, how optimistic are you about 2021? And do you think it's going to be as good as 2019 was? I think it's going to be a very complicated year, 2021, because, of course, let's not forget that the vast majority of bookings that were booked in 2020 deferred or postponed to 2021. So normally, when the industry gets into the fourth quarter this year, it's starting to book for 2021 for the following year. Obviously, January and February next year would typically be very busy booking times. I suspect they're not going to be as busy uh, this year going forward and I think space is going to be at a premium uh, next year because where there would normally be masses of space available I think there will be much less space available essentially you're trying to get two years of travel consolidated into one year and I think that might make it very difficult um, for tour operators and then I think if there's a second wave I think people are going to hesitate about booking as well so I think 2021 is, is up for grabs at the moment, um, but I think it will be far from simple. Uh, my own view is that things will not normalize 
in a way that we might like them to before 2022. The new abnormal. Um, thank you, George. Uh, that's fantastic. I'm going to hand back to Serge. We haven't even talked about sustainable travel, responsible travel. That's all for another day, but obviously very hot topics as well. Serge, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for obviously moderating these sessions. And uh, George, I can only compliment you for uh, your bravery and uh, for your forceful honesty as well. And, uh, and I think that I love the fact that you give a little nod to the French, that mm. they, they, they know how to protest when it's required, which is, uh, I think, a kind of a national sport in my country. And, uh, but, but I think there is something interesting in it. Uh, and that's why I was so keen that uh, with the two of you uh, on the discussion is that, you know, one of my favorite book of all time was always uh, the trial by Kafka, which is a kind of a blueprint for existentialism, where you, you don't have to, uh, if you just accept and you go with the flow, uh, it could uh, end up with your entire demise. Uh, and I think that what I really like is that uh, you are a, a big kind of existentialism in a, in a world where uh, everybody looking for uh, doom and gloom, and, uh, and you really stand up for what you believe. And, and try to change in many ways, and, and I've done contributed certainly uh, to change the course of history. And I think that it's a kind of a, a real example of uh, uh, smart and goodwill people with uh, strong stamina and a lot of patience uh, can actually change a lot of things for our industry because, as you say, our industry is sometimes very fragmented. And uh, as you clearly mentioned uh, before, like. Well, the travel industry is not, uh, uh, we're not used to see the travel industry making a lot of noise. Uh, and it's kind of good sometimes that, and I think that's why I think originally the WDDC was created because nobody was taking this industry very seriously. It was all about chemical and petroleums and cars industries and so on and so on. Uh, and I think that what, what this uh, pandemic has really shown is not only how this industry is important economically uh, for, as you say, we talk about uh, a life, saving life, but also saving livelihood, which is in many ways uh, saving lives in general. But, but I think how much the travel industry is, or the hospital industry at large, is uh, intricated with uh, our own way of life. This is the way we socialize, and to, to keep something a bit more simple is that, you know, the, the first thing when I come in this country, I, I ask people what, what is a, what a pub than a pub, and I was told that it's called a public place, that's why it's, it's a shortage for pub because this is a place where people socialize. And I realize that in many ways, hospitality restaurant is a place we socialize and it's helped our, our mental health and also us being social animal. And traveling is a way also that we tend to reconnect with uh, our loved ones. And, and I think there is a, a tremendous longing for all our customers to come back on track. And, and therefore, we can't thank enough all the people who are you know, on that journey. And like I said, not going with the flow, but try to resist COVID-19, not only in terms of health, but in terms of protecting the life of the many. So thanks to both of you for these uh, amazing discussions, but also for your immense contributions, uh, past, present, and certainly futures for our industry, because you are true leaders in your own field and uh, you come in our respect. So thank you very much. And, and for audience, I would like to say that, uh, uh, obviously look out for uh, more pure webinars or uh, webinars from all our shows. We know that we, we might have some, we, we'll have some exciting news as well about the House of Beyond, and there will be a new program coming also shortly. So look at for more information coming from our companies. And uh, in the meantime, stay safe, keep yourself very passionate, and keep the travel industry going. Thank you very much, all of you, and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye.